Okay, let's get started. All right, so um, only announcement. So the the uh, unit assessment for this unit is available. Um, it's due next week. There's a um, the reading for next. So actually, all the readings, the, the perusal, all the perusal reading for the rest of the semester are on Canvas. So um, there's sort of one a week. Keep in mind that all the reading exercises that drop the lowest three. There's about three left. Uh, the unit assessments, you know, basically drop uh, for half of them or so. Um, so there's very few of these assignments left, and we're starting to get into the things where you can start making decisions about uh, whether you just want to take it as a drop or or complete it, uh, you know, completely. So if you're already feeling pretty good about your grade, then you may not have to put a lot of effort into these. Um, but you know, feel free to to take care of them. Um, and then the only other thing is the status update for your creative project is due next week. I think next Saturday, so like a week from this uh, Saturday. If you look at the rubric for that, not expecting very much. Um, if you haven't done a whole lot of your creative project, that's okay. Um, I just mainly want a check in to sort of see how things are. If things have significantly changed, what did you change? Uh, just so I have a chance to reassess if you'd say, well, it sounds like the thing that, that I thought was going to work was going to work, and now I'm doing something else. Just so I have a quick chance to say, hey, that, that sounds a little too ambitious. Maybe we can dial it down or or um or you know make sure you uh you know uh, make it clear with what um principles from the course that you're emphasizing so on and so forth so that's kind of what the status update is all about it's not meant to be a high stress assignment um it's just mean to begin kind of like tell me where you are on things and how you plan to go forward and then for those creative things um i just want to make sure that you, whatever you're doing demonstrates kind of a mastery, a personal mastery of something in the course. So there's a bunch of ways to get there, but um, but it has to be a coherent example uh, that demonstrates that you have picked something up from the course and made it your own and in a way that could be shared to someone else. So um, we've got, you know, now within the news, lots of different shortcuts to creativity and so on. And, you know, I'm not saying that those uh, can't be used, but um, but just make sure that in the final product, it really is demonstrating your own personal mastery. That's what I'll be looking for when I'm reviewing those. All right, so any questions about uh, timelines moving forward? Great. Okay, so today, a uh, different format than our usual format. Um, just um, uh, wanted to take a, an opportunity to show a little bit more visual examples of some of these things and to get into a little bit more of the complexities of them all. So today I'm going to showcase some, some things that are kind of classic work, some things that come from colleagues of mine, some things that come from my own lab, students in my lab, postdocs in my lab, and so on. So some of this hits a little closer to home and some of it's a little more sort of the basic stuff. And and uh, But where it connects here is that ultimately we ended last time talking about ways in which these natural distributed systems process information. And we talked about, Melly Mitchell gave a very sort of simplistic view of trail laying in um, an ant, that's the kind of a trail motif here. Um, and so I want to kind of, uh, drill down into that. And so we can sort of see that it's not quite as simple as Mitchell said, but a lot of the key components that Mitchell is talking about in terms of focused search and unfocused search, these sorts of things still very much apply. So um, before we get there, just to give kind of a, a little bit of background. Um, so we've been talking about ants, uh, which we're going to get to in a second. And I mentioned that all ants, bees, and wasps um, evolved from a solitary wasp like this one. And so this is what we call kind of a phylogeny. So this is sort of the tree of life. So you know, Darwin talked about all life coming from one species, one organism, one universal common ancestor, and life sort of evolving as a tree after that. And this is kind of captures that idea. The way you get these trees <clears throat> initially before genomics uh, came into account is, uh, is you looked at characters, so phenotypic characters, and you looked for overlaps. And you'd say like, oh, well, we've got a bunch of different trees here. Well, we know they're all trees, so that's one thing that they share. These have particular shaped leaves. So these, you know, these, this tree, this tree, and this tree all differ in some ways, but they all have the same leaves. Whereas this tree over here is very different leaves. If you got a list of all of these different things, you could eventually pile all these things up and all of the um, overlaps would sort of constrain uh, the possibilities for um, this kind of tree here, which would sort of um, suggest 
um, how closely related these different trees, or in this case, insects, um, are. And so you can actually look at kind of the set of all of the different characters that are expressed and then come up with something to say that um, that these two species are different, but they had a common ancestor um, not that long ago. Whereas these two species are very different, their common ancestor was much farther, uh, much longer ago. And when we do that, when we look at, um, these are called uh, Hymenoptera. So these are a particular type of insect with wings. They have four wings. A lot of insects have four wings and you don't have to, this is not stuff you necessarily have to memorize or anything. I'm just trying to give some context here. And this term, um, hymenoptera, the P-T-E-R-A means wing, and the, the hymen um, means married. Um, and so if we look at um, the, on the back of uh, a hymenopteran, uh, its wings, then the two wings are on one side. It says one big wing and a, and a back wing back here. And they fold up kind of like a Swiss army knife when they're on their back. But when they flail out, there's little hooks on the bottom of the top wing that hook into um, kind of Velcro, you know, uh, latches on the on the bottom wing, and they latch together so that these two wings turn into one big flight surface. And that idea of the the wings being married together is where this term hymenoptera comes from. So it just shows like all insects that have these wings that lock together. We've been into this group of hymenoptera. Beetles aren't like that. They're called coleoptera. Coleoptera is, is means sheathed wing. And that's because in beetles, the front wings that are kind of where my shoulders are, are a giant shell. And if you go to a beetle and you kind of peel them back and you see their real wings underneath, they're kind of uh, sheathed by that. So that's an example of sometimes these names give away how we're grouping these things together. If we look at all the hymenoptera here, um, then there's a special group inside it called the apocrida. And it doesn't matter too much about all this, but again, this just basically means um, it's an insect that has a little waist in the middle of it. And, um, and basically the, the first kind of apocrypha here was a solitary wasp. It was just a wasp that doesn't hang out in a nest and have a bunch of other wasps helping it out. It just does its own thing. It does everything that an animal does. It has to find food, it has to find a mate, um, it has to find shelter, um, has to, you know, find protection and all that sort of things. That's what this solitary wasp did. And that one solitary wasp, through the process of evolution and natural selection, diversified in to the huge diversity of wasps we have today. That's all this green stuff, as well as ants and bees. So when we talk about wasps, biologists would say that's uh, it's a paraphyletic term. And all that means is um is if it wasn't for ants and bees wasps would be a very simple thing it'd be easy to say what a wasp is um, but we've excluded ants and bees from our normal parlance we don't normally say an ant is a wasp or a bee is a wasp and so it makes it harder to define what a wasp is just like um, birds for example are dinosaurs well we don't call them dinosaurs but i could show you a phylogeny of dinosaurs and birds would fit right in there birds are living dinosaurs we just don't call them that but because of that dinosaurs are so-called paraphyletic instead of monophyletic it's just kind of hard to define them it's almost like an accident that birds are not called dinosaurs today just like it's an accident sort of that ants and bees are not called wasps in reality, bees are vegetarian wasps, and ants are wasps that live on the ground. And um, so, but we just don't call them that. So all of these evolved from a solitary wasp, like this little ichneumid right here. Um, and um, some of them are social and some of them aren't. Kind of, the, kind of the cool thing about it, even though bees, wasps, and um, ants all have sociality, they didn't evolve from the same sociality. It turned out that bee sociality evolved independently of wasp sociality, which is bonded, uh, evolved independently from ant sociality. So there's, um, and then within the bees um, and within the wasps, there are also different origins of sociality um, as well. And so there are several different origins of sociality in the social insects, but there are only social ants. That's why we call them ob 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 obligately, obligately uh, social. So there's no um, solitary ant out there. So this is, um, you know, so I'm just trying to give you background to say that when we talk about ants, um, what we're really talking about is 
something that evolved from a solitary insect, but now does all the solitary jobs across a group. And so we can look at that group, like these leaf cutters here. And um, if I open up a leaf cutter colony, like so this was an Atacephalodes, um, so these are workers and queens and virgin queens from a Atacephalodes colony like you find down in Central America. And we actually have a closely related leaf cutter here in Phoenix. Uh, it goes by the genus Acromermex. You used to find them around Phoenix, but now with urbanization, they've kind of been pushed out. If you've ever gone out to Boyce Thompson Arboretum, which is about a half hour, 45 minutes to the east of Phoenix, you can still find these hanging around. If you go down to Tucson, they're a lot easier to find. Um, they look very similar to this, but they're a lot smaller. But um, I'm showing this up here to show you that the, the um, the workers here, all um, in leaf cutters, have different sizes and they have different casts. So um, they do different jobs. So, like this one here, this big one here, um, it has these big mandibles that can be used, you can imagine, for defense or whatever. But it turns out that these leaf cutters cut leaves. And there are, are these ants that have specially sort of special heads that, that act like scissors. They turn to the on the 90 degrees and then they chop like scissors and they they anchor like a compass. They anchor their back feet at the tip of the leaf and then they cut in a circle like a compass and you get these little circular cuts out of leaves that they carry back to their nest, a leaf cutter ants. Um, but the ones that have really sharp mandibles, they stay up in a tree and cut those mandibles dull over time and the ones that get dull mandibles there they carry leaves back um some of these other um ants um so some of the smaller ones they will ride on the back of the bigger ones and when flies um there's these forehead flies that want to come and try to lay their eggs inside the ants and the small ones will actually sit on the top of the leaf and they'll fight the flies off as the flies are coming down so they all have different jobs that they're doing um, and uh, all sort of separated here. None of these workers can produce more workers. Their only job, their only way to get fitness, to get reproductive success, is to help the queen produce more eggs. So that's why sometimes we refer to workers as an extended phenotype of the queen. It's like a trait that she gets to express in other individuals. It's kind of interesting, right? So. How does the, what's the queen, how does she do her job? Well, she occasionally, by the way, how do you get all these workers? Well, most of what we know is from studying honeybees, closely related. Um, and at least in honeybees, the way you get different types of workers is by feeding them differently. So um, at least what we think, although there's some evidence in ants that things might work a little more complicated, but, um, but she lays eggs. Those eggs develop into larvae, which need to be fed. The workers feed the larvae. And the different ways you can feed the larvae cause them to turn on different genes. They all have the same genes, but some get turned on in some casts, others in another cast, based on how they're being fed. It's like they're programming them with food. And so then some will develop into one type of worker and some will develop into another. If they're fed in another type of way, then instead of developing into a worker, they develop into a virgin queen like this one. That one has wings, remember, wasps. Um, and so she, and then I didn't uh, have the male picture up here, but a male, a virgin male, all of these are female. Uh, so they all have ovaries. Um, none of them have testes. But um, the male, um, which looks a lot like this one, but has a really tiny head. Um, and so the, uh, and then if you look really closely on the queens, they have an extra set of uh, visuals. So they're right underneath here. If I pull it away, it's a little triangular crown. And the, the workers don't have that. They're, those are called ocelli. They allow them to see kind of other things up in the sky that they might need to see while flying that these ones will never need. So they don't develop them. So all the sexuals, all the reproductives, they have that. So the males and these reproductive females have wings. They fly away. They mate, the males die after mating. The females don't need their wings anymore. So they rip them off. They literally bring their leg up and tear their wings off. And so if you look at this queen here, if you notice she's got like a bump here and a bump here, it's referred to as wing scars. That's from her actually ripped her wings off early in her life. This could have been 10, 20 years ago when she ripped those off. And, um, and at that point, She's got all this big flight muscle that she doesn't need anymore. 
So what most ants do with that flight muscle is their body metabolizes their flight muscle. It's a little snack pack that they can use to feed out their mouth to emerging workers. So that's muscle that they use for a little while, and then they turn it into food that, because remember when she, after she does this, she's alone. She just made it. Um, she has the ability to lay eggs. She has no workers with her. She walks around and starts digging a, a hole on her own to start her own colony off. And she just has to wait for her first workers to emerge and they'll emerge into larvae. And that's the only time in her life where she will feed workers and she can feed them based on these resources that she's brought with them. And then once those workers and the workers are often these really tiny workers called minims that only emerge um, during this sort of helper period when this queen just is getting started out. And those minims then start foraging on their own, uh, bringing food back into the colony until the real workers start arriving. At that point, the queen stops doing any feeding or anything like that, and the workers take over, and all she does is lay eggs. And um, she just basically becomes the colony's ovaries. And, uh, and so the colony can be viewed as a, what we refer to often as a superorganism, where these are like different cell types. And, um, and because this queen, only has to worry about producing eggs. She doesn't have to do any of the high fatigue physiological things that you have to do with foraging or feeding or anything like that. And that's one of the reasons why she can live for decades, whereas these might only live for a month. So, um, so a lot of really crazy stuff there. The same way you have skin cells that you know flaking off continuously, whereas you've got other parts of your body um, that. Um, that have a much longer lifetime. So it's like, again, a, a multicellular organism spread out over multiple individuals. That's your basic ant colony. And all ant colonies are social. And honeybees, it's a little bit like this. They just don't have the morphological diversity um, that the ants do here. Um, and then some social wasps, it's like this as well. Termites, it's surprisingly a lot like this, but termites are a totally different type of insect. They're actually a social cockroach. And termites' genetics are like you and I, my genetic. So they have um, what they call diploid uh, genetics. So it's like the, the same sort of, of uh, genes that you and I have. The interesting thing about ants, they have what's called haplodiploid genetics, which means males only have one set of genes. We have two sets of genes, one from mom, one from dad. Males only have one set of genes. They're flying sperm. They are, they just, you know, the females all have two sets. And that's one of the ways that they have sex determination. If you have two sets of genes, you're female. If you have one set of genes, you're male. So it's a lot of really interesting things going on under the covers here. So that's your basic ant 101, your background in ants, as told through the story of leafcutter ants. Now, I want to add one more thing before I go on to kind of the stuff that more relates to the class. But like I said, I picked leaf cutters here. Um, leaf cutters are, are particularly weird ant because they do all this foraging, they cut leaves, but they don't eat the leaves. Does anybody know what they actually do with the leaves? Anybody heard about leaf cutters before? Yeah. They grow fungus with it. That's right. Leaf cutters are fungus farmers. So, um, if you open up a leaf cutter colony, we've got colonies here at ASU, um, but you can dig them up you know, underground as well. You'll find that they have these giant balls of fungus. And this is a fungus that does not grow anywhere else in nature. It only grows inside leaf cutter colonies. And that fungus uses the leaves for its nutrition and it produces um, basically the outputs that um, that the, the, the ants can metabolize. And so they eat the fungus and they feed the fungus. And so they don't forage for themselves. Now I mentioned that this fungus doesn't grow anywhere else in nature. So that means that this virgin queen, before she leaves, she grabs a starter batch of fungus from her old colony and she flies around with it, mating with it in her mandible. So she carries fungus while she mates, while she digs, while she establishes. And then she has to nurture her own fungus underground. And um, because again, that fungus isn't growing anywhere else. She can't find it anywhere else. And then it has to grow up into its own thing. So that's unique 
to these fungus farming ants, but it's the evolution of farming. It is a monoculture as well, just like corn is a monoculture for us. And they have all the same problems that we have with our monocultures inside there. So, um, it, you know, anything you've heard about like, oh, worried about the, the liabilities, you know, it's again, it's the adaptive cycle. They've specialized on one fungus and that's made them vulnerable, just like we've specialized on certain foods and that's made us vulnerable. So we can study that by studying them. So any questions? Yeah. Yeah, if, if, if you kill the fungus, you kill the colony. Um, and they, they just can't recover from that. Now, what's interesting is um, there are leaf cutters that live in areas where um, they, they come together and unrelated queens will start the colony together. Once the workers emerge, then there might be a fight to the death to decide which queen takes over, but at least initially, unrelated queens come together. Now, we don't know how unrelated queens decide to come together, um, but there is speculation that fungus diversity is part of it. So it's possible that I've got a little bit of fungus, you've got a little bit of fungus, you've got a little bit of fungus, um, your fungus is a lot like mine, but your fungus is very different than mine. And so I choose to dig with you because now we've got diversity in fungus, which might give us robustness to these problems that might come up. Whereas if I dug with you, because our two funguses are the same, then any problems that are my fungus is prone to are also going to be prone to yours. So um, diversity ends up becoming a big thing in a lot of these ants. Um, for example, oyana bees. In um, honeybees, um, they actually mate with multiple males. I'll see, and I'll get to you in just a second. And so a honeybee queen will mate with four or five different males. And it turns out that a bunch of the phenotypes that show up in honeybee workers can be tracked directly to the patcher line. So you have like five males that she mated with, and she stores that sperm for like, again, you know, 10 years. And every time she fertilizes an egg, it's like her body decides which sperm to fertilize the egg with. And she gets a diversity of workers that correspond to the diversity of males that she met with. And it appears like that diversity, one of the reasons they have it is that honeybees have this weird thing where they actually take workers with them when they create new colonies. And so they don't get the chance to reset. They inherit all of the parasitic baggage of their previous colony. So for them, having diverse worker phenotypes and diverse worker genotypes is really important because that may be the only way they can hold off uh, just being overrun by some uh, parasitic specialist. Whereas in ants um, that, um, that fly away and start their own colonies alone, this is what we call a genetic bottleneck. And because of that, there's less pressure on having genetic diversity because if there's some parasite in their old colony, they can shake it off uh, as long as they stay kind of isolated, and then when they fly away, they'll um, you know they'll be able to start a new life, you know, totally fresh. So, was there a question over here? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's kind of it's kind of both. I mean, like the, these these cavities are so constrained that you get these fungus chambers where it's just like a whole lot of fungus and it doesn't necessarily stay partitioned up. Um, now, there's a lot that isn't known. It is maybe possible that they they set up, that as they start digging, they create separate chambers. And, and I don't think we've, people have done the genomics to actually test that out, but it's my speculation from raising these in the lab and things like that, that they're just all mixed together. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that that is, I, I guess you could call it instinct. Is that, that this is how, this is their reproductive cycle. You know, that is like, just like um, you inherit some of your microbiome from your mother, um, uh, from having been in her womb um, and being expelled from her body, then uh, the microbiome that you pick up is very similar to the microbiome that he picks up when she takes a piece of fungus with her. It's just... It's, you know, it is a behavior that is, um, you know, it, it, you can imagine that uh, initially there were fungus growing ants that 
um, used fungus from the nature. There are fungus growing ants, other species that use fungus that's out in nature. Um, but you can imagine one of them found a really good cultivar and some of those um, uh, ants just happened to have some of it on them when they flew away. And those ants tend to be like, do much better because they could start with a really good cultivar of this fungus. And that eventually evolved into them sort of deliberately, you know, taking a piece off and bringing it with them. Yeah. So it's evolutionary learning. All right, any other questions? It's like ants 101. It's like that most ants work roughly this way, except for the fungus stuff. There are a lot of really wonderful exceptions. All right, so that's ants. Um, and so now we've been talking about trail leg. Now in the 80s, when people were studying the dynamics of trail laying, um, there, there are about 20,000 different species of ants. And for every question that you study, you have to pick the right model organism um, in order to sort of best study that question. And a great um, ant to study trail laying in was this ant called Laceus niger. So there's an Laceus niger queen. There's her workers around it. Um, in the lab, this is uh, an image taken from Tommy Tchotchke's lab. Um, there, it's very easy to get them to build these robust trails, like you see here, looking down on it. And so um, they're very good at trail laying. Um, this is a type of recruitment in ants that we refer to as mass recruitment. So, um, so this is the problem I had kind of with the Mitchell chapter is that she sort of blended a bunch of different types of recruitment types into one and kind of like presented trail laying as if it like divided workers up, but it doesn't really do that. Um, in trail laying, which falls under mass recruitment, um, it works a lot like Mitchell was saying, the mechanism here, um, ants leave uh, the nest and they search randomly and they find feeders. And, um, and if they find a feeder, then they can come back to the nest and they know the way back to the nest because they navigate it. So the animals know the way back home. Um, and they can then lay down a trail um, coming back down to the nest here. And if, um, as new ants leave this nest, they will be, their, um, their antennae will pick up a bit of that trail and they'll have a, a tendency to head toward that um, feeder. And then they, after receiving that feeder, will then uh, do a trail back down to, the, to this direction. And gradually that trail gets reinforced. Eventually, the concentration gets so high that when ants um, leave the nest, they just can't ignore that it's there. And they just, there's no random search anymore. They pretty much just follow the trail. And eventually, you get all of your foragers in one feeder. And that's what we refer to as mass recruitment. So generally, trail laying falls under mass recruitment, and you get ants that just go to kind of one feeder. All effort is directed to exploit a single uh, feeder. Now, it's say, well, what's the adaptive value here? The, there's a hypothesis that uh, mass recruiting evolved because it's in particular in ants, where you have multiple types of ants that are required to, to process a, a discovered food, and you need at least a certain number of each type. And so rather than trying to get like recruit five of this type, five of this type, five of this type, you just bring all of your foragers to one place and you're guaranteed to have enough. So that was one sort of thought there. And um, if there's a lot of food sources here, and they're all pretty good and pretty equivalent, then you just forage on this one until it's all gone. Then the trail goes away. And then if you're still hungry, then you find a new one and forage on that one until it's all gone. And so it's not that big of a deal to kind of choose um, you know, I mean, you want to choose the best if there's multiple options, but as long as you just find the best, um, there's no worry that it's going to stop being the best, you know, and so you just bring all your foragers to the best one, you exploit it maximally, you come back, if you're still hungry, you go to the next best. That's how mass recruitment works. So there are questions on this basic idea of trail laying. This is sort of what we talked about last time. It does not divide resources between the feeders. It concentrates them on the best feeder. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That's right. So back in the nest here, only a small fraction of them are foraging. And there's a bunch back here taking care of brood, um, maybe you know, excavating, doing all sorts of other things. Yeah.
Right. So that, that she was talking about encounter rate uh, and, and they regulate. Yes. And so that's what I haven't really talked about here. We will see um, a little bit of that later on here. But but yeah, so if if demands are constant, then you get sort of like a fraction of ants. In reality, um, like ants inside the nest, they're switching between different multiple tasks, but they might spend 75% of their time taking care of brood and 25% or maybe 10% of the time, the, the other balance doing a couple of other tasks. But if a demand increases, then, um, you know, like they, let's say they start noticing that there's more food coming in. Um, if there's now, um, so a bunch of ants, when they bring back food and bees as well, um, they're, they need to hand it off to another ant. And if there's a bunch of ants waiting to hand their food off, then that can induce a bunch of the processing ants to, um, or a bunch of ants that aren't processing food to shift away from what they're doing and start processing food. And so that's kind of what Mitchell is talking about is like how your encounter rate with um, ants that are carrying food, ants that are not carrying food, ants that are um, sitting alone, your encounter rate with food that's not being handled by an ant, all of these encounter rates ants seem to be sensitive with uh, to and they can adjust their switching probabilities from tasks so that if there's one task, like if there's a bunch of larvae that are hungry, then ants that are doing something else, if they bump into a bunch of hungry larvae that are begging, because larvae, little ant larvae can beg for food. So if there's a bunch of larvae that they look like little commas and the little commas, little mouths, and they can kind of like beg for food. And if there's a bunch of these little larvae that are begging for food and they're not being, then you can get ants that weren't taking care of the, 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 those larvae shift in to primarily taking care of those larvae. So you can get shifts in task allocation. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I think what it was, at least what I think she was meant to say, to say here is, so we often use um, this thing called the response threshold model. We talk about task allocation here, and it, it's easier to think about when you think about like who, um, how many of you live with someone else? All right. How many of you of those are the one who does the dishes? All right. A, a small, well, quite a few. All right. Well, I'm a little sort of wavering. All right. So um, the, the response threshold model, this idea that let's say um, that you, um, when you see more than three dishes in the sink, it drives you crazy. You just can't stand it. But your roommate can take up to 10 dishes in the sink. Now, your roommate, if the dishes ever get to 10, your roommate will do the dishes. But the thing is, it never gets that bad because it's so bad for you when there's three dishes in the sink that you do the dishes, and then that stimulus goes away for your roommate. And so then you, it ends up emerging that you are the dishwasher and your roommate is hopefully something else. Um, and that's like a division of labor that just emerges because you have a different threshold than the other one. Now, if suddenly um, you have a party or whatever, then now you've got like 30 dishes in the sink and it, it triggers both your thresholds. And now both of you are doing dishes simultaneously. And so that's kind of an idea that of um, it, it is a regulation where you can you can end up sort of recruiting others into the task. But then once the stimuli has been brought back down, then some of those others will go off to other tasks. And so the force the dishwashing force will get smaller again. And that's what you actually see happen in ant colonies is that the force responsible for taking care of the brood or taking care of food that's coming in, um, if there's a sudden surplus, you get a growth in ants that weren't doing that before start doing that. But then once that relieves the stimulus and once the stimulus goes away, then they all come back down and you have a smaller group again. And so it's not, um, it's not like these trails where it just sucks everyone into one task. Now, if the demand is really, really, really large, that can suck everyone into that task, but hopefully you'll be so efficient at doing that task that you'll reduce the stimulus and that everyone will return back to their old jobs once the stimulus gets back down. I hope that answers the question. Any other general questions about this trail laying idea? All right, so the big question in trail laying is not how do the ants get distributed? Because they only go to the best. The big question in trail laying is what happens if the best moves? What happens if that stops being the best or um, it stays the same, but that one becomes even better later? Um, and it turns out that Lasius 
are really bad at that. So, um, so this is a case where um, a, you have one molar sucrose solution, the laceous here, one molar sucrose solution, the laceous here. Here's the start of the experiment. Um, they just happen to, you know, be on this one molar feeder a little bit more, but this process of trailing uh, happens. It ends up breaking the symmetry between the two of them. By the end, you get most of them on one on this feeder up here, and the other feeder, even though it's of equivalent quality, doesn't have very many ants on it. And so they break symmetry and concentrate all their efforts on one feeder. Now, what happens if you start with a 0.1 molar feeder, so not very sweet, and 50 minutes in, you add the one molar feeder. Laceus, this is an experiment with Laceus, um, they um, are not able to switch. Most of them stay at the poorer feeder, even though the much, much better feeder is now available. So it looks like mass recruitment, the way Laceus does it, is really bad at tracking changes. But that's probably not a big deal for Laceus because Laceus forges on like flowers and things like that, like, you know, or dead arthropods, things that probably aren't going to go away or things that um, they're very equivalent sources out there. So there's not like a sudden, like, oh, there's like suddenly this big thing that they need to attend to uh, and they need to switch away from what they're, and if they don't attend to it quickly, it's going to go away. Now, um, so yeah, they are 100% exploitation. Um, and so this unquote focused noisy search that starts the process is totally replaced by focused recruitment. And then until that exploitation is over, they basically don't go back to search. That's how laciest work. Now, um, I want to bring up then there's a different ant, Phytoli megacephala. Um, this ant is also a mass recruiting ant. Beautiful ant. Um, it has two different morphs. It has this big morph here. These ones, these little ones, these are actually the ones that are really aggressive. The big ones are primarily there to crack open big things like seeds and stuff. So they're primarily there to process food items. Uh, but it's a great example of how when they find uh, food, they want to try to get as many of both types there um, because you might need the big ones to crack stuff open. You might need the little ones to tear things apart and carry them back. So there they want a food site there. Um, added, you know, just you know, FYI, these are their three queens. This is a type of ant that has multiple queens. We call polygynous. Um, and so you can see the three queens, you can see this big major, and then you can see these minors here, as well as some brood. So it's another mass recruiting ant, just like Laceus. Um, It's predatory, though. So it actually does hunt down things that might still be alive. It's competitive. Termites in it compete for the same food sources. So if they find a food, if they don't exploit it immediately, termites might come by and steal it. Um, and so these food sources may be ephemeral, meaning they may disappear or reappear very often. So it's important for them to be able to track quality. And so um, what a different study did more recently, um, Audrey Dustor uh, took care of this, is, that, is they sort of showed that, you know, Fidoli is much better at Lacius. So what they did is they gave them a Y maze like I was kind of talking about there, similar to where, where you had a high quality and a low quality. Um, it turns out they implemented it as an equal quality, but one was closer. So that was the high quality. And, um, and they initially um, concentrate on high quality. Then after an hour, they remove the high quality and Lace and uh, Fidoli then um, shift their efforts. And then they now are focused on... Um, so the, this is the population of the high quality goes down because the food or feeder is gone, but the population at the low quality goes up. And then at, after hour two, they put the high quality back and Fidoli tracks it. It notices that the high quality comes back and it gets rid of the low quality. This second part is something Laceus can't do. So Fidoli seems to be much better at this. So the question is, how are they better? And the, in this study, they, they have evidence that what's happening here is that individual foragers are relatively bad at following trails. And so most foragers will follow a trail like Laceus, but there's a few that make errors or mistakes, and they just kind of go off and wander. It's almost like they ignore the smell of the trail, or they might have been on it for a while, and they lose it. And then once they lose it, they can't find it again. And then they just start searching. And 
alone, you might think that this is some sort of problem with Fidoli. But it turns out that these ants that got lost were the ones that found the high quality feeder when it was reintroduced and started laying a trail to it. And they're the ones that caused, allowed them to switch. So in this case, what um, the mistakes of these ants were doing was really um, sort of allowing them to blend the focused exploitation with the unfocused exploration. So basically, they're sort of 80% exploiters, where 20% are always still searching. And that ability to keep the searching going, keep the exploration going, is what allows them to be more dynamic. It makes them a little slower at maybe reaching consensus on one particular site, but it allows them to track these sites. And so if there's uncertainty in your environment, the rule that we're getting here is you maybe should introduce uncertainty in your recruiting style. So it's kind of like if you always know that there's only ever going to be one good restaurant, then if somebody tells you that, like, I really like Ike's, you know, their subs are great, you know, then you should trust them and just go to Ike. But if you know that there's a good chance of new restaurants being popped up, even if somebody tells you they really like Ike, then there's like maybe a 20% chance you just totally ignore them. And that helps guarantee that you'll find the new restaurant when it pops up. And, um, and that's kind of what's going on here. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So the thought here, and I, the, not enough is known about whether that mistake probability changes over time. The basic coarse grain thought here is that it's sort of set by evolution at a species level. So Fidoli evolved in ephemeral environments, and so they got whatever, 20%. Lasius evolved in constant environments, so they got 100%. If there was another ant that was even in a more ephemeral environment where there's just no reason to recruit at all, because once you recruit, it's gone, then they would just, you know, maybe they wouldn't lay down a trail. If they did lay down a trail, they'd just totally ignore it. It might be 10% or what 90%, whichever direction I'm going in here. But the idea is the way you weight public and private information, the thought is that that could be selected for by the habitat. So environments that are regular select for social information. Environments that are inconsistent select Gesundheit for um, uh, private information. If that makes sense. And likewise, if you're building a human organization, sharing information, you got to understand your information ecology. You got to understand your habitat um, because you know it might be worthless to trust other people's information if it's likely that the environment is frequently uh, changing. And that's what we're seeing here as we look across different species of ants. All right, any questions about that, Fidoli? Um, I might also mention, I don't think I have an image of this, um, but, um, but Fidoli, uh, I mentioned that leafcutter ants, they farm fungus. Fidoli have husbandry. They actually collect these little aphids, these other types of insects, and they move them around on plants and the aphids suck out honeydew and then the, um, and then the phytoli um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry, I meant uh, the laceus. Laceus um, then can suck up the honeydew. So there's actually several different types of ants that do this. Is that, so there's farming as well as um, sort of, again, husbandry um, uh, that is evolved in ants, you know, two sort of forms of agriculture. Um, so it's kind of interesting thing, little cows, basically aphid cows that they milk. All right. So um, the other example I want to do along the, these lines here, um, these are fire ants, red imported fire ants. We have fire ants in Arizona. They're not these fire ants, um, but uh, they're kind of they're similar, same genus. Um, and Ed Wilson, kind of a famous biologist, um, met was was inspired by that Haldane and Spurway paper that used information theory to study honeybees. And he did that to study pheromone trails in fire ants. And, um, and so he basically, uh, these are example traces of trails. So basically he had a sugar bait that he put out. He waited for an ant to get to the sugar bait. Um, he let the ant lay a trail, he removed the bait, and then he watched ants follow that trail. And these are example paths where they would all go out. I think the dotted line is them going out and there wasn't a sugar bait. So they'd eventually turn around and they come back. So they have these turn back points like that are up here 
and down here and somewhere over here um, where the ant goes out, can't find the sugar bait and comes back. And he studied, um, well, the turn back points, that's kind of like where the ant thought it was being led to. So maybe I can study the relationship between where the trail started and where these ants went to and kind of do an information theoretic analysis. And so he did that. Um, and this is the, those turn back points. So you can imagine the nest is way over here. And then each one of these dots is a turn back point. The middle here, that's where the feeder originally was and where the uh, ant that led the trail started from. And you can see that on average, uh, they, they arrive at where the feeder was, but there's quite a bit of spread um, in both directions here. And so, and Wilson noticed that this spread was identical to the spread you see in honeybees. And he thought this is really weird. Honeybees, you might be able to uh, explain it, um, but these ants are laying trails on the ground. They should be able to have higher resolution. So what's going on here? And so um, Wilson noted that there are two possible reasons that he could come up with for this. For one, it might just be that each ant has a limited amount of pheromones. And so because they have a limited amount of pheromones, they lay a kind of a wimpy trail and it's just hard to follow. Or the other thing might be that, um, you know, he noted that in the lab, um, these ants, so you can feed them live prey, like mealworms that are kind of wriggling around. And very often, if he would drop a mealworm in somewhere here, and an ant would leave a trail to it, that mealworm would start walking off. But ants that were returning would sort of make an error, but they'd end up finding the mealworm anyway. And so his thought was that, you know what, these fire ants, have evolved for ephemeral prey, for prey that move, um, and they're predatory. And so maybe what they're actually communicating is not the location of where they found the prey, but an uncertainty cone of where the prey might be once a recruit comes back. And, um, and that was sort of his explanation. So it's very similar to this idea that if you prey on ephemeral prey, Evidence seems to be that you are a crappy trail follower, but that seems to be adaptive because crappy trail following allows you to spread your workers out so that you can find information about the uncertain environment. So uncertainty in the environment often is matched with randomness in the implementation in natural systems. That's sort of a lesson that we get here. So there are questions about this example. This makes sense. It's kind of a catcher's mitt um, for these moving prey. All right. So, um, yeah, the individual tracking errors add kind of a randomness, which, again, going back to the Melanie Mitchell's point, um, the trail laying itself is about focused exploitation. But if you add a little randomness, you reintroduce unfocused exploration. And in many of these ants, you need a balance of those two. And that balance will not always be 0, 100. It'll be some non-trivial mixture. And that's what we're getting out of this. All right, so um, those are kind of our basic trail laying ideas. Now I want to get into the things that, you know, where I got the videos of where I want to start really pushing the envelope on weirdness. Um, uh, and, um, and so the motivation here is that all of these that I talked about here uh, we're focused on this idea of using trails for exploitation and then adding a little randomness in to maintain the exploration. Now, is it possible to use trails for exploration too? Well, there's another organism that I want to talk about that we sometimes uh, work with um, in my lab and my colleagues' lab. Um, and this here, as I'll, I'll show in uh, uh, more details about in a second, is, um, is what we call it myxomycete. Protist, so it's not an animal, it's not a plant, it's a protist. Um, this is uh, this is a petri dish you can see behind here, uh, the glass dish, and this is one entire cell. It's a single cell filled with multiple nuclei. It's a cell that can change its shape, it can move around, but it is a single cell. Um, those of you who've lived in areas where there's a lot of mulch, um, especially a little moisture areas. Might be familiar. Has anybody ever seen this on mulch before? This is yeah. Okay, so this is something called dog vomit, um, and that also is this. It's uh, it's not the same species. The one I should have showed you. This is from my lab, covering a, a bunch of um, these uh, petri dishes. These are oats that they're foraging on. Um, both of these um, fit in the 
same group. This is uh, Pisarum polycephalum. This is Fuligoseptica. Um, and uh, one entire cell, multiple nuclei, moves around. You know, and so it's not a fungus. A lot of people think it's a fungus. So you can come back a couple hours later, and this blob will be elsewhere because it's you know moved around the same way these move around in this petri dish. So um, this uh, you know this is a, a video here BBC put together um, that this is time lapse. It would be horrifying if this was real time, but this is this same uh, organism. It's going over the leaf litter in a forest. Notice it's sort of bubbling a little bit here, and it moves around as it starts digesting these nutrients that it can find on the forest floor, um, just moving and moving and moving. It's a lot of, you know, it's a fascinating thing. Again, one single cell kind of covering all this. A lot of, I'll let this run for just a second here because it's kind of a cool visual. Um, how many of you have seen or played The Last of Us? Yeah, the, so, you know, uh, well, Pedro Pascal and all that. Um, the opening sequence of The Last of Us, even though The Last of Us is about a fungus called Ophiocordyceps, which is different than cordyceps, even though they say cordyceps a lot in the, in the thing, um, the opening sequence is used, most of that is this, it's slime mold, which is not fungus, so it behaves very differently, but it just makes for a much better visual. All right, so um, other cool things you can do with slime mold, so this was done by a colleague, um, I'll start this video in a second, but this is a little tiny bit of slime mold and this is a nutrient source. This is a wall, a U-shaped wall right here. And, um, and so what the, uh, if I can do this with this guy. All right, I guess I'll just go and do it over here. So, um, so what's gonna what you're gonna see here in a second is this slime mold will start moving. It will move into the trap, but then it'll find its way out of the trap and it will eventually and very quickly find its way to the food source. So it spreads out a little bit, bounces around the trap, goes up the trap, around, comes down, finds the food source. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can sense nutrient gradient. Absolutely. Now, um, so, and it can travel up gradients. And so if, if there's a little bit of food here and more there and more there, um, yeah, you can think of it as smelling and sort of moving up the sort of smell gradient. Well, so in this case, there's this auger plate, and there is probably a nutrient gradient that has been induced by the auger just through diffusion, um, right, you know, going through here. And I think that's what's causing the slime mold to move. But there is, um, there's a, this barrier is symmetrical. So it, going up, it's actually going the wrong way. Like if it was just following, um, I don't have to change that. If it was just following the, um, uh, the, the gradient, it would get stuck right here because that's where the gradient is strongest. So it's particularly notable that it goes backwards to go around. There was just a notice here. What your question? Mm -hmm. Right, well, so, yeah, so slime, so the stuff that I've been studying in slime mold has to do with um, how it actually solves multi-objective problems. So it turns out that slime mold can balance its protein and carbohydrate intake simultaneously. And so you can give it multiple food sources that have different mixtures, and then you can give it another set of food sources that have different mixtures than those. And then you can study how many protein and carbohydrates are coming into the slime mold. And in both cases, it's the same amount. And so it's able to reallocate itself to have a balanced diet in both cases. And so I'm trying to understand the mechanisms that allow it to sort of do that. Um, and so in this case, uh, Chris Reed was sort of studying, um, you know, actually these memory effects. And so, um, you know, the idea here is that um, did it somehow, could it somehow remember where it's been and then not go there? So, so just anticipating, if I move forward here to the next slide, um, if we, zoom in at high resolution on a plate that has some of the slime mold on it. Um, you'll see the slime mold here above me. That's uh, kind of weird. Let's see if I can get that to switch back to 
Well, all right. So um, you see the slime mold that's like right here. Um, and then, um, and it's all yellow. Over here, if you look closely, um, there's like this ghost of a slime mold. That's not slime mold. That's slime trail that slime mold leaves behind. And, and so what Chris showed uh, with Tanya and Audrey and Madalena uh, is that um, slime mold is repelled from its own slime. It's actually attracted a little bit to the slime of other slime mold. And, and this allows it to sort of keep track of where it's been. And they think that this is how it gets out of traps. Is it'll go into that U-shaped trap and say, oh, I've been here, this was unsuccessful. I'm gonna move away from my own slime. And that ends up becoming the dominant signal over the nutrient gradient. And once it gets to an area without its slime, it follows the nutrient gradient again. And that's how it gets out of that trap. So it does have memory, but the memory is pushed into, it's like, instead of you remembering where you were, you like took a marker with you everywhere and just marked where you were and then use that as your memory. Paul? Right, that's right, absolutely. You can erase its memory by getting rid of these trails. That's right, that's right. But I mean, what is like, we have internalized our memory stores so we can take them with us. But so, you know, what is memory? Yeah. Other questions about this example. So this is an example where I like to bring this up to contrast it with the ants because the ants use trails to draw ants together to exploit. But the slime mold uses trails to remember where it's been to enhance exploration. So trails can be used in both ways, just depending on whether they're attractive or repulsive. All right, so that's cool, slime mold. Um, but that's not all they can do. You can take a slime mold, you can put it in a maze. It will spread out and fill the whole maze um, and just and reconnect into one big cell again. Now, after it's done that, um, this is a maze. It's got a, an entrance and an exit. And so what you can go now is, um, so entrance and exit, um, slime mold really likes oats, like Quaker oats. And so you can place an oat at the entrance and you can place an oat at the exit, which we'll see here in a second. And um, the slime mold will react to the sudden introduction of nutrients. And, um, and so they're going to speed it up here again, time lapse a little bit. It starts bubbling. It starts uh, moving toward these oats. And if we start zooming out and looking at what's happening throughout the maze, waves of activity are going through the maze as it takes over these oats. And uh, eventually what's going to happen is in parts of the maze that are not on the efficient path between these oats, uh, you're going to see the slime retract and go away. And on parts of the maze, that are on the shortest path between these two oats, they'll be reinforced. And so I think that's what we're seeing. It's going a little slow, so maybe I'll jump ahead. You can see stuff is, um, is retracting here on, on parts of the maze that aren't there. Um, so if I jump ahead a little bit, then we can see that the slime mold is able to find the shortest path through the maze. Um, which is kind of a, a, a supply chain route. This is the, the best way to deliver nutrients from these two nutrient sources to the rest of the cell is by collecting the cell along the shortest path. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, the, a, um, a different group um, around the same time um, did uh, this, but they, they put oats on all of the major subway stops in Tokyo, and, and they looked at what the slime mold found, and it turns out that it found all the same routes. And they've done it now in the United States as well. You put oats on all the big cities, and it like reconstructs uh, you know, the same highways, the same highway routes or whatever. So basically, it's able to find these efficient paths that have been deliberately designed by human engineers. Um, you know, but it's totally brainless. No neurons. It's a single cell. And so, um, so what some of my colleagues uh, did, and I sort of loaned a postdoc out for some of this work, is um, is basically we've got a, a line of slime here 
um, and there are little red dots. Those have been added on top of it to show you the diameter of the slime along that. And we can look at five of those red dots, one, two, three, four, five across here. And then down here, this is where they're being plotted. These are their diameters being plotted over time. We know in the physics of how the slime mold works that if, um, if two parts of a slime mold oscillate at different um, frequencies, different velocities, they create a pressure gradient. And that's what causes the slime mold to change its shape. So the thought here was saying, well, if we know that these frequencies are changing over time based on nutrients that are being added to the slime mold, then um, maybe we can watch which part of the cell changes first and, um, and sort of figure out where the information comes in and then watch information flow through uh, the slime mold. And in order to do that, we actually use frameworks based on information theory. We use something called transfer entropy to do that. And I don't want to go into the details of it, but basically what we find is that on the side of the slime mold that has the poor food source, that's over here, and then we've got the side of the slime mold that has the good food source over here, that you see um, predictive information flowing outward from parts of the cell that are closest to the bad food source. And all of that information seems to be received in other words, you, these movements can predict these movements on those that are close to the good food source. So this sort of shows that the slime mold seems to be reacting to the relatively poor food source by contracting away from it. And, um, and that's kind of uh, an example we have here of how we can follow information through a distributed body. Again, I don't want to go into the math of it all, but I just want to show that we can um, actually measure information in space. And we do that to study uh, the architecture of slime mold and of ants. All right, so that's slime mold. Um, only a couple minutes left, but I at least want to um, introduce um, one other organism here um, just uh, because it's, it's, it's really very interesting. So these are Timothorax regatulus, uh, rock ants, Timothorax. A lot of these things apply to the genus Timothorax more broadly. These are the ants we can find around here in Arizona. Um, very small, so this colony here um, it would fit in the palm of my hand. Uh, there's a queen right there in the middle. Um, and so uh, they do not use pheromone trails. They have their own version of kind of a waggle dam, which I might get to here in a second, um, but uh, I don't know if we'll necessarily, we might run out of time. But, um, but the big thing here is that their version of the waggle dance doesn't have this nonlinear recruitment that pheromone trails do. So with pheromone trails, as you add concentration to the trail, you, you go from ants ignoring it to like crossing a threshold, and then they just can't ignore it. And they concentrate on one trail. These ants have a waggle dance, sort of, which is much more like this line one where um, as you add recruiters to the ants, you get a graded response from the other ant. And that allows them, if I give them, or if, in this case, if Zach um, gave them a 0.8 molar solution and 0.1 molar solution, they'll allocate more foragers to the 0.8 molar. And then if he switches them, then they switch their allocation. So they're able to allocate based on quality, like Mitchell was saying, uh, with the trails, but they don't use trails and they're able to track changes in their environment. And so that's the advantage of so-called linear recruitment strategies um, like these ones here. And they can do all sorts of other crazy things. So we can give them nests of different qualities and ask them uh, which nest do they prefer. And so it turns out that, that they have a, like a 15 dimensional preference plane. They, they, they gauge whether a nest is darker than another nest, where the entrance size is smaller, whether other ants have been in there. There's a bunch of different things. If you hold all of the other things constant and you just change that one thing, you can predictably get the ant colony to move in to the other one. And so in this case, I'm just focusing on darkness and entrance size. They like dark nests. They like entrance sizes. This kind of view, like, should feel kind of like that Pareto frontier thing going on here. And because we know that, we can now start playing games with them that we normally would play in cognitive psychology. We can give them decoys. So I can give them a nest that's dark. I can give them a nest that has a small entrance size. And then I can give them a decoy nest that maybe has the same darkness, but a larger entrance size. Or 
Um, it has the same small entrance size. They like small entrance sizes, but it's much brighter. So in other words, they're nests that are dominated. They're nests that they would never, ever choose. It's like being offered to be, you can buy a bike for a dollar, you can buy a bike for $50, or you can buy the exact same bike for $500. You would never buy the $500 bike. You buy either the one or the 50 based on your preference. The five, the existence of the 500 should not change your preference. But as we know in humans, if you give me a high priced option that I'll never buy, it will change the way I feel about the options I will buy. And the question is, does that happen in ants? And it turns out, so Taka Sasaki was a PhD student here at ASU, and he did that. And he did it at the individual level and at the group level. And so at the individual level, you give ants a bunch of brood, you give them nests with a decoy, and you see where they move all the brood. And it turns out that if you that they their preferences change based on whether there's a decoy. They never move the brood into the decoy, but the presence of the decoy changes which um, nest that they do move the brood into. But at the group level, there's no decoy effect. Their preferences do not change when there's a decoy. So groups are rational, even though individuals are not. That's kind of pretty cool. And there's a bunch of these other experiments here that, um, you know, I, I, the only one I kind of want to mention here before we close um, is that you can give, uh, likewise, ants a poor nest and a good nest, or four poor nests and four good nests. And when you do this, then you find that um, in individuals alone will visit every nest. Individuals in groups only visit one or two nests. Individuals alone, when there are two nests, they'll pick the good nest. Individuals in groups, they pick at chance. It's too many. The two eight nests, it just it, they just pick one randomly. But in groups, then it turns out that um, they can also pick a good nest out of eight nests. So you get cognitive overload in individuals, but not in groups. So I'm going to have to stop here. So I'm not going to be able to show you what their waggle dance looks like. Maybe I can show you that next week. But um, but uh, the big point I'm getting here is that we can aggregate individuals in such a way that we don't get cognitive overload. And I'm over, so I'm not going to ask you an attendance question. Everybody gets the point. Thanks for uh, your time.